ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا انه من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله بلغ الرساله وادى الامانه ونصح الامه وكشف الغمة وتركنا على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا وقدوتنا محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah, the sustainer, the cherisher the creator of the heavens and the earth, and I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final messenger, dear brothers, dear sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, it is absolutely essential that in these days that we're living, in this month of Dhul Hijjah, that you remember how sacred and extraordinary these days are how special they are to Allah Azza wa Jal. For some reason, the month of Ramadan stands out as sacred. We pay attention to it. We get ready for it. We strive in it. We experience the emotional and spiritual highs. And it wasn't too long ago that it passed. For some reason, the month of the Hijjah, and especially the first 10 days of it, often pass us by and we're not paying attention. We miss out on the sacredness of these days. Brothers and sisters, these are days about which the Prophet ﷺ tells us in a hadith narrated by Ibn Umar, that there are no days, imagine and pay attention. These are days that you're living right now, that Allah has given you, allowed you to live through. The Prophet ﷺ says that there are no days in your life, in your entire year, that are greater to Allah Azza wa Jal than these days. There are no days according to the Prophet ﷺ in which good deeds that please Allah are more beloved to Allah than in these days. You want to do a good deed? For Allah, it's most beloved if you do them in these days. And dear brothers and sisters, when Allah Himself says something is great to me, it's not like us saying great, isn't it? Somebody who does not have much money might deem $10 to be great. Somebody who has a job might deem 100,000 to be great. Somebody who owns a company might deem 10 million to be great. Somebody who runs the government will only render trillions to be great. But Allah who runs the dominion, who owns the heavens and the earth, when He says great, it's not like you are my great. So imagine He says, these days are great to me. It's far beyond our comprehension, brothers and sisters. And by Allah, it's a summons. It's a call from Allah to you and me to wake up to what gifts Allah has given us in these days. He's saying, wake up and pay attention before it's over. The 10 days will indeed be over. SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters, and we might not be paying attention. On Sunday, the 10 days over of the Hijjah, already eight days have passed us by. And today is the ninth. How special and why are they so special, dear brothers and sisters? Because Allah deemed these days as such. And within those days, to tell you how sacred they are to Allah, Allah has mandated that journey we call Hajj. As we sit here, brothers and sisters, at this hour, 1.17, right at this moment, you know what's happening in another part of the world? In this, on this ninth day of the Hijjah, millions, hundreds of thousands of people, brothers and sisters, probably numbering around 2 million now, if not more, maybe 2 to 3 million. Allah knows the numbers. As we sit here to listen to this khutbah and think of our classes, hundreds of thousands have descended upon Mecca to begin a journey of their lives, the journey of their lives, the most sacred, the most special journey they can undertake in their lives that any human, any human being can undertake. And today, they've commenced the first day of Hajj, the first of six days of Hajj. And here they are in Mina, tonight probably flocking Mina, a town with tents, where they're going to spend their night to get ready for tomorrow, the greatest day of the year, the day of Arafah. How many of us brothers and sisters are reflecting upon that reality that is happening as we sit down? 
How many of us are, are expecting or are, are thinking, great, these are great times. What am I doing in them? Brothers and sisters, Allah Azza wa Jal, this very journey that we call Hajj, has deemed it as a pillar of Islam. Many of us brothers and sisters who are younger don't think much of Hajj. They think this is something to be done sometime later in life when I have the means. But we often do not think about the meanings of Hajj and how relevant they are to us. That if we can really, brothers and sisters, undertake that journey soon, let's do it. Because it can change your life. Just as it has changed the lives of many. How and why, brothers and sisters? Just look at the fact, the fundamental fact that Allah said it's a pillar of Islam. So imagine, brothers and sisters, the entire structure of Islam and how big it is. All of Islam is based on these pillars, five. What does a pillar mean? It means if you remove the pillar, the entire structure falls. So we know one of them is shahada. You have to testify that La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. The central pillar of the structure. If it's not there, there's no Islam. But we know a key one is salah. And how often do we do salah, brothers and sisters? We're obliged. Allah says, you're mandated. A command that came from the heavens that you pray to me five times a day. If it's missing, the entire structure of Islam for you is, has fallen. It, ha it cannot be erected, no matter what you do. If salah is missing, it's called a pillar. And there's the zakah, there's the fasting of one month out of the year. But suddenly you hear hajj. Hajj as a pillar. How many days does hajj take, brothers and sisters? Amazingly, hajj is not required for everybody. It's only the, for those who have the means and the health. So there are categories of people that are exempt from hajj to begin with. So imagine many people and their lives and they've not performed hajj because they couldn't do it. And Allah accepts from them. And there are those who are obliged to do hajj and they choose not to do it. But if they do do it, brothers and sisters, if you end up doing this hajj, that is a pillar of the structure, how many days do you spend in hajj? At max, at the max, six days. Six continuous days. Remember the salah as a pillar? Every single day you're doing it. Five times a day for the rest of your life. But hajj, another pillar, only takes six continue, continuous days. How is it, brothers and sisters, that a, 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 that, that a ibadah, that Allah has asked us to do as a pillar, it only takes six days of your life. Imagine six days out of an entire life, let's say it's 60 or 70 years. What six days? It's not much. So how can a pillar be something that is done only in six days and be equal to the other, to the other pillars? It must be that this pillar, brothers and sisters, despite the fact that it's so short and it only takes six days out of your entire life, does wonders in your life when it's done. That's why brothers and sisters, even though it's short and it's only six days, Allah deemed it as a pillar because of its impact and its power in our lives. SubhanAllah, dear brothers and sisters, there are many meanings to Hajj, many lessons to be learned. And only someone who undertakes the journey can share with you some of those lessons. But I'd like to focus on one critical dimension of Hajj that can really, inshaAllah, help you understand why it's a pillar of Islam. Dear brothers and sisters, those who have gone on the journey of Hajj, and SubhanAllah, as I said, hundreds of thousands are undertaking this journey for the first time today. As we sit down and, as I said, listen to this khutbah. Dear brothers and sisters, Hajj is indeed a mini experience of the journey that we will one day take back to Allah Azza wa Jal. It's a dress rehearsal for your death, and it's a dress rehearsal for something called the Day of Judgment for your ultimate return back to Allah. What does that mean? It means when you go on Hajj, every single thing that you do, every single experience, the rituals that you perform, collectively with hundreds of thousands that are with you in the same place, everything reminds you of your journey back to Allah Azza wa Jal. That's why when you emerge out of it, if you've done it right, you're a different human being. You've tasted an experience that is, brings you the closest to death to feeling what it means to die and be back with Allah Azza wa Jal. So you cannot be the same person when you leave it. It's impossible. But imagine you're going through it and there are millions around you, gathered in the same place, undertaking the same steps as you. Dear brothers and sisters, it's unlike anything you'll ever feel in your life. And again, ask those who have gone there and let them share with you. 
perhaps that will inshallah engender a feeling, a desire, a yearning for you to go to Hajj. Because you'll indeed change as a human being if you've indeed done it right. Let's visit what the Hujaj have done. If you know any pilgrims that have gone on Hajj, do you remember when they, when, before they left a few days ago? Do you remember what they've done? Do you remember the emails that came to you from pilgrims that are going on Hajj telling you, please forgive me? How many people have received those? Have you? It's not. I've received few of them. Please forgive me, I'm about to go on the, on the journey of Hajj. It's amazing, why are you asking for forgiveness now? SubhanAllah. Doesn't it signal to something to you about this, the, the mindset of the person leaving? When you ask somebody to forgive you, oftentimes it's sick people who are about to die. They know they're leaving and I need to make up with you. It's not worth it because I might not come back. Brothers and sisters, it's a reminder. They're remembering that they might not come back. SubhanAllah from the get-go. They send out emails and make phone calls for everybody to forgive them. Friend or enemy. They write their wills. SubhanAllah. They pay all of their debts, small or large. Amazing. They get ready. They pack their bags. And oftentimes, if they're wise, they're small. They don't have much in them. And they leave their jobs. And they don't want to even think about their jobs. Often you leave your family, unless you're going with your family. You leave your children, you leave everything. Your brothers and sisters, they prepare for days with all of these things, these rituals that I just shared with you. What does this remind you of? Brothers and sisters, if this is what a pilgrim did, recognizing him, he's going on a journey that he might not come back from, what about the preparation for the hereafter and the journey of the death that we'll face one day? Imagine if this preparation was required for a pilgrim going on a few days and inshallah coming back. But them recognizing they may not come back and they had to, to do all of this. What about someone preparing for death? All of us brothers and sisters are pilgrims facing death, yet we don't prepare for it. SubhanAllah, from the beginning, Allah is putting it in the mind of the pilgrim, get ready for your death. This is a journey that will remind you of this. When you go to, the, to Mecca or Medina, you start, finally when you want to start your journey, just as the Hajjaj did yesterday or this morning, what is the first thing that they do? I want you to think of this, brothers and sisters. And remember what we do with dead people. So they've already experienced that departure from their homelands and it felt like I'm going on a journey I might not come back from. What is the next thing they do? They go take on, you know, uh, take showers, clip their nails, perhaps whatever it is that they want to do, trim their hair, you know, uh, put on cologne or perfume and they wear what? Two pieces of cloth, white in color, unstitched. Unstitched. As soon as they put on these two pieces of cloth, their brothers and sisters, that's called ihram. And they begin with the intention, it's ihram. What is ihram? It's the beginning of the journey of hajj. Ihram comes from the word even, a derivative of it is haram. Now certain things that were halal become haram for them. They clipped their nails before, they can no longer do it now. They cannot cut their hair. So the halal, some of the halals become haram. They cannot argue. They cannot yell or scream or curse. It spoils their hajj. They have to undertake that or endure that for the next few days. Even keeping the same two pieces of cloth on them for, for the three days. They've started it today, brothers and sisters. They will not take off these two pieces of cloth until Sunday. Sunday night. SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters. And I just wanted to think of millions dressed the same way. The men, in this case. Two pieces of white cloth. What does it remind of? Wallahi, brothers and sisters, those who have, who have experienced this, when they took, uh, you know, they took that shower and they clipped their nails and they got ready, perfumed themselves and suddenly they took off everything, even their underwear and put on these two pieces of cloth, they felt like, it's my death. It's my return back to Allah Azza wa Jal. And it looks like the shroud that we put the dead person in. Exactly. And you know what else we do with dead people? We also wash them up, subhanAllah, and perfume them and then put on that shroud on them. It's exactly the same experience. What does it remind of? Once more, the journey back to Allah Azza wa Jal. They put on these things, brothers and sisters. And now everything is for the sake of Allah Azza They've left their families and jobs. They've left everything for the sake of Allah and they're willing to put up the price and do everything that Allah has asked them for in the next six days to make Allah happy. But Allah is generous. And He's going to put them through experiences unlike any other they've experienced in their lives, even though it is difficult. Even though it is difficult. 
they put on the ihram, brothers and sisters. And just as I told you today, the first activity they do, they go to a place, open field with tents. Thousands and thousands of tents. Everybody gets into their tent. Why? They had to step outside, brothers and sisters. They're not yet in Kaaba. They had to step outside, spend their night in this place in anticipation and in preparation for what? The greatest day of their lives. What day is that? Arafah. It's tomorrow. So Allah is telling them, get out. Go stay in, stay in these tents and think about next, the next day, tomorrow. Think about what it means. Sit and reflect upon Allah. Make dhikr. Take yourself outside of your luxuries, any home. Sit in a tent crammed like sardines. Little comfort. Leave it all. Because Allah now is going to put you through an incredible spiritual experience. But you have to take yourself outside to sit in that tent for the night and spend your night thinking about the day of Arafah, the greatest day of the year. And subhanAllah, as we speak, brothers and sisters, they're in their tents. And thousands are still flocking Mina, who are late because of the buses. It's so crowded. It takes hours to get to it sometimes. And they'll get there at some point and they'll spend the night, tomorrow morning after Fajr. And all these Hajjaj brothers and sisters of pilgrims, Wallahi, if you, if just, just talk to them. And inshallah one day, if you have not, you'll be there yourself. The anxiety, the anticipation of tomorrow is unparalleled. They'll wake up tomorrow and pray Fajr. And what will they do? They'll start a journey to commence a day that is considered once more the greatest day of the year, the greatest day of their lives, the day of Arafah. What kind of a day is that, brothers and sisters? And it's taking place tomorrow. It's a day about which, or towards which, or about which the shaitan is most angry. Why? Imagine that tomorrow, the shaitan is the angriest. Because it's a day in which Allah forgives more people than any other day. It is narrated, brothers and sisters, that on the day of Arafah, Allah frees more necks, more people from the hellfire than any other day. It's a day about which the Prophet ﷺ tells us, Allah is so happy on that day. Because why? Imagine, brothers and sisters, the scene of millions of people, dressed the same. SubhanAllah, pleading, beseeching Allah for forgiveness. They spend the entire day tomorrow doing this. They go to Arafah, travel in buses or on foot. Several miles, it takes you outside of the sacred land of the Haram. You have to still take, go outside. You're still not back in the sacred house of Allah Azza wa Jal. Look at how the journey goes. Mina, you stay in the tent. You're outside. Then you go to another place called Arafah. You begin the day after dawn. And they spend their entire day, brothers and sisters, tomorrow making remembrance of Allah. And most importantly, supplications. Because Allah answers all the supplications. And he's waiting to see who is who's eager for the forgiveness of Allah. Who trusts that Allah will forgive. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, a lot of people go to Arafah. And they think that as soon as they arrive there, oh, your heart is going to be feeling so spiritual. It just opens and, and the connection to the, happen, the, the heavens happen. It doesn't happen that way. Why is that? Allah is testing people, brothers and sisters. There are people who are distracted. And Allah wants you to understand that even faith, feeling that joy with Allah Azza wa Jal makes requires effort. Personally, brothers and sisters, by Allah, Allah is my witness. I was so concerned in that day. I started my dua around probably 11, 30, 12 until we arrived at Araf. And Wallahi, brothers and sisters, we were so exhausted from the night before. It was around 4 or 4.30 and I'm not feeling a thing. No tranquility in my heart. And by the way, this turns out to be not a unique experience. I thought it was something is messed up in me. Right? It turns out a lot of people are experiencing the same thing. Our entire group, no one is even shedding a tear. And you know, brothers and sisters, when you're, when you're, when you're feeling that close to Allah Azza wa Jal, and you, you remember Ramadan in the last 10 days, you shed a tear when you feel that tranquility in your heart, when you feel the love of Allah Azza wa Jal. Well, Allah, brothers and sisters, many people are not feeling it yet. 4.30, what happens? SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters, and something amazing happened. The leader of the group, a very beloved, SubhanAllah, friend and person that I have the highest respect for, says, you know what? It seems like a lot of people are not feeling anything. Let's make collective dua. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, we started making collective dua for the next hours. If you saw the tears that came from the eyes of people, you'll be blown away. One hour. It took that one hour, one hour brothers and sisters, before sunset. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, it was a moment of liberation. Because the entire day was spent and there was no feeling of any tranquility. Everybody's experience is different. But this is what people are yearning for, that they feel the love of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And indeed, Allah does not hold it back. 
So the Prophet ﷺ tells us about this fact, that Allah is so happy with the efforts of people who have left everything for the sake of Allah to undertake that journey. And here they are in the plains of Arafah, pleading, Ya Allah, forgive me. Allah will not, brothers and sisters, deprive them. He descends to the lowest heaven. Look at how happy Allah is. He descends to the lowest heaven. And He's so happy with these people that have come. The pilgrims, the servants of Allah Azza wa Jal, that He says to His angels, Oh my angels, look at my servants. They're disheveled. Disheveled hair. Filled with dust. Indeed, brothers and sisters, if you see what will happen to your, to your, to your the, the two pieces of cloth, they turn brown on the third, on the second or third day. You're exhausted, they're brown, but it's all for the sake of Allah, and it doesn't matter. It feels good when you're sacrificing for the sake of Allah because you're the beneficiary. And he says to them, look at them, they're disheveled, they're, they're filled with dust, but they come to me. Bear witness all my angels that have forgiven all of them. Wow, brothers and sisters, those pilgrims are thinking about it. They're thinking about it tonight in anticipation of tomorrow. Those of us who are not pilgrims, Allah is telling us, SubhanAllah, come and raise to me. That's why, brothers and sisters, we're encouraged to fast tomorrow. Fast. The forgiveness is not restricted to those who are there. The Prophet ﷺ tells us, you fast tomorrow. Allah forgives what? One past year. The past year, imagine all of your sins are forgiven. And a future year. Indeed, Allah is so generous. That's out of our brothers and sisters. And at sunset, they're done with the greatest day of Hajj. And they're still outside of the Haram. What happens next? It's not over. All of this journey, the rigors, the intensity of it is all for the sake of Allah. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Oh Allah, we're at your service. Take us wherever you want to take us. And wallahi, you'll feel energy, brothers and sisters, in Hajj that you don't know where it's coming from. You finish from Arafah. It's sunset. You're tired. You're exhausted. It's not over. Now we move. Hundreds of thousands, brothers and sisters, leaving the plains of Arafah to go to a place called Al-Muzdalifah. And Muzdalifah comes from a word that means coming closer. Coming closer to what? Here is the day of Arafah cleansing people. Allah cleanses people on the day of Arafah. You know when you shower and you get ready to put on your clothes, you're about to meet who? Someone who's significant, who's important. Wallahi, it's the same thing that is happening. Allah takes them outside, makes them spend their, their night in Mina. Think about the day of Arafah. On the day of Arafah, He cleanses people and purifies them. Then He brings them closer to a place called the Muzdalifah. It's a big valley. And what happens in Muzdalifah? Extraordinary. Another experience that reminds you of death. Brothers and sisters, imagine a sea of people. It's nighttime, and you arrive at this valley, huge. And everybody just goes on the ground, puts on their, you know, subhanAllah, their, 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 their uh, 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 pillows and so forth, and they sleep on the ground. You are not to spend the night in Muzdalifa sleeping on the ground with nothing covering you but the sky. In open, on, on, on an open ground, in an open air. No roof, no wall, no house. But imagine the side brothers and sisters when you finally lay down and you look up and it's the sky, or you get up and you look around and it's hundreds of thousands laying down. And what are they wearing again? The two pieces of cloth, the white clothes, right? SubhanAllah brothers and sisters. Ask those who have slept and woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning. When you wake up brothers and sisters, you have to wake up before Fajr, right? It's long lines for the restroom, or the, you know, whatever, SubhanAllah, another one of those difficulties that surely people go through, yet it's still sweet. Because it is for the sake of Allah Azza. You get up, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna, you want to go and make wudu. 3 o'clock, 3.30 brothers and sisters, people get up, and a lot of people will tell you they get up, from their sleep and they feel dazed and disoriented. Because it's a new scene. You've, it's not like you wake up every day and you, 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 know, you look around and you're outside of your home, sleeping in a desert, right? Or outside, you know, on the street. You wake up and it's a new experience. You look around and it's hundreds of thousands of people. SubhanAllah. And SubhanAllah brothers and sisters, the days, the disorientation reminds of the disorientation that someone coming out of their grave will feel. And SubhanAllah brothers and sisters, we're told about this. When people come out of their grave, they come out like moth. When Allah begins the day of judgment, SubhanAllah brothers and sisters, like moth, confused, dazed. They don't know what has happened. What has awakened them from their sleep in their graves? Same exact experience. Everybody starts waking up, SubhanAllah brothers and sisters from Fajr. Awesome scene. Incredible scene. All these people with this, these white pieces of cloth waking up, getting up together, or at different times to pray Fajr. 
another reminder of that thing called death and the meaning of Allah Azza wa Jal. They're done with Muzdalifah brothers and sisters. It's Fajr now. Now they go back to a place to throw the Jamarat. You know those, uh, you know, pelting the, the pebbles against the structure that symbolizes the Shaytan. They do it later in the day. And then as, as, as the day proceeds, and this will be happening on the day of Eid, on Sunday, at the end, brother and sisters, you go and cut your hair or shave it. And it's an amazing symbolic experience. Shave the head. Why? Why are we doing this, brother and sisters? It's as if Allah is telling us, even the hair that you're so proud of, that you love so much, that ornaments you, give it up for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And watch what Allah will give you when you give it up. You give it up everything, brother and sisters, your luxuries, your comfort, even your hair. You want the mercy of Allah and Allah delivers. You're done with all of this, you're now ready to see what? Kaaba. Allah cleansed you, got you ready, made you sacrifice. No, you're now ready to be in the sacred valley of Allah to see Kaaba. And indeed, brothers and sisters, people descend on Kaaba for the tawaf. SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters. Whether people have seen it there or before, clearly you see it, you see the Kaaba before the beginning of Hajj in Umrah. But brothers and sisters, ask those who see the Kaaba. When it's the first time they've seen it, what it will feel like. Brothers and sisters, it's a place where people shed tears right away. Right away, it grips you. The side of Kaaba, even through the door of the Haram, you have not even gone inside. You just see a, a, you know, a, a glimpse of the Kaaba. Just a portion of it. And your heart is taken away. Right away. Right away, brothers and sisters. And you feel as if all the sacrifice, all the fatigue that you had is all gone. Serenity like you've never felt in your life. Peace like you've never felt before. And you go into the Haram, brothers and sisters. And you start looking at the Kaaba. What's the Kaaba ultimately? What are we praying now? Towards what? Qibla. Isn't it? Are we seeing the Qibla? We don't see the Qibla, brothers and sisters. You've been praying for years and you don't see the Qibla. Finally, it unfolds itself in front of your eyes. The Qibla you've been praying towards for years is visible in front of your eyes. It is indeed the most fulfilling of experiences. You'll feel more at home than any other place in your life. SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters, it is indeed the most awesome sight you'll ever have in your life. The most awesome thing you'll ever look at in your life, it's that side of Kaaba. We ask Allah Azza wa to make us among those who will perform the pilgrimage before we die. Aqulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah al-azim aliyya wa lakum fasta. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-khalq wa sayyidil mursaleen, sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Dear brothers and sisters, the journey of the Hajj continues. People start circumambulating this house of Allah that Allah Himself called house, a home, home of serenity and peace. And then they descend from there to the to, to the Sa'i, to walking between the two hills of, 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 of Safa and Marwa, where Hajar traveled back and forth looking for water. You re experience that great journey of Hajar as she looked for the water for her son to quench him. And indeed, the journey continues for another three days, brothers and sisters. But I want to focus your attention on one thing. It is indeed six days. The culmination of it is always, always being in that Kaaba with Allah Azza wa Jal. And you know what Allah says about this Kaaba? <coughs> Subhanallah, Allah says, brothers and sisters, Surah Al-Baqarah, with جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ And indeed, when we made this, He didn't call it masjid, He didn't call it a structure, He said house. When we made this house, مَثَابَةً وَأَمْنًا لِلنَّاسِ he said, we made it a mathaba, and I'll explain what that means, and a source of peace and serenity for people. What is mathaba? Even those who do not understand what it means, ask what people feel. Brothers and sisters, despite the rigors of Hajj, you're tired, you're fatigued, you see the Kaaba, it, it wipes all, all, all discomfort in your heart, all anxieties, everything is washed away. You're at peace that no one can describe but yourself, to yourself. Joy unlike any other. You really feel at home, as Allah said in the verse, a house. Wallahi, you feel at home more than your own home. You only think of Allah in that moment. But Allah says, Mathaba. When you leave the Kaaba, ask anybody who is in Mecca, what do they like to do? They want to go back to the Kaaba. Ask people when they're done with Hajj, even if it was tiring and difficult. What do you want? I can't wait until I go back. But I thought it was tiring and difficult. They all will tell you, we cannot, go, we cannot wait until we go back to Hajj. We cannot wait until we go back and look at that Kaaba. And that's what Mathaba means. It's a destination that you keep yearning to go back to after you see it. You know why, brothers and sisters? Because we feel at home with Allah there. That's why Allah called it a house. Brothers and sisters, 
Indeed, the Hajj journey is a reminder of the hereafter. I want you to think, if these joys, if this peace that the pilgrims feel when they lay their eyes on Kaaba feels this incredible, this, 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 this great, right? If it feels like that, and it's not like any other experience, it's only a house of Allah. He called the house. And you remember Allah more than any other place here. You're in His sacred valley. And you feel like you don't want to take your eyes off of the Kaaba. What will happen on the day when we see the face of Allah Azza The creator of the heavens and the earth. As the Prophet says, there is no joy like seeing the face of Allah Azza So people when they're in Jannah, and they're experiencing the bliss and serenity and beauty of Jannah, with their families, eternal, eternal health and youth, anything that you desire, they're summoned to Allah Azza wa Jal. And SubhanAllah, Allah asks them, what do you want? And they say, how can we ask for anything? Oh Allah, we've given us everything. But He said, this is the day of the, of the extra reward, ask. Finally, all the people of Jannah say, Ya Allah, show us your face. And Allah removes the veil, and Allah manifests Himself. And people get to see the face of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ says that when they see His face, they can't take their eyes off of Him. And they forget about every other joy in Jannah. All they want is keep looking at Allah Dear brothers and sisters, if you want to experience something close to being with Allah in His home, home of peace, in the hereafter, a glimpse or a mini joy, even though it's not like that joy of the hereafter, but at least injects in your heart something close to it. To being with Allah in Jannah, seeing His face, indeed brothers and sisters make Kaaba your next destination. Even as a young person, it doesn't have, it's not for just old people, brothers and sisters. A lot of young people, Wallahi, collect, you know, save money. Go out of their way to just say, I want to go there because I want to feel that thing. I want to experience Hajj. Because it does transform, dear brothers and sisters. But if we're not pilgrims, and here we are today, brothers and sisters, on the first day of Hajj, Allah has given us the opportunities. Make dua, brothers and sisters. Make dua, a lot of dua today. As people are making dua in Mina. And tomorrow on the day of Arafah, fast for the sake of Allah and make one of your du'as. Oh Allah, make me go to Hajj. Ya Allah, empower me to go to Hajj. Give me the means to go to Hajj. Do not deprive me. Because it is indeed, brothers and sisters, a journey unlike any other that by Allah will change your life. When you taste it, you will tell the story yourself. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to enlighten us with His guidance. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept from the pilgrims who have gone and left their families on the journey of Hajj. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to forgive our sins, to bestow His mercy upon us. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us die with the words of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal not to deprive us of seeing His face in the hereafter and to make us among the inhabitants of Jannah. Allah maghfir lana wa rahamna wa afu anna wa tawalla amrana wa ahsan khalasana. Allah marzukna hajja baytik al-atiq ya rabbal alameen. Allah marzukna hajja mabrura ya Allah. Allah marzukna hajja mabrura. Allah marzukna hajja mabrura ya rabbal sama. والأرض. تقبل منا أعمالنا تقبل منا عملنا الصالح يا رب السماوات والأرض واجعل عملنا كله خالصا لوجهك الكريم يا رب العالمين وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وأخذ الصلاة